Let's get ready to talk some diseases. Yes. Fun part. We're going to talk about the different forms of meningitis, encephalitis, meningioencephalitis, and whatnot. And we will discuss what the differences are between those closely sounding words. First off, let's talk meningitis. Remember, anything ends in itis means infection of inflammation of what prefaces it. So meningitis means infection slash inflammation of the meninges. So inflammation of the meninges, swelling due to increased fluid due to invasion by the immune cells. As I talked about two lectures ago, if you have increased fluid into the brain, into the spinal cord, something's got to give because those are set volumes, okay? You can't go to your car, go to your home or whatever building or whatever and suddenly decide to make it bigger, okay? You can't just push out the sides and have it swell up. It is a set shape a set volume same with your skull same with the thin canal going down through your vertebral column for your spinal cord swelling of the meninges something's going to get compacted generally what's going to get compacted not the cerebral spinal fluid because that can only be compacted under pressure so much but what can give and give relatively easily, the neurons, the neurons of your brain, the neurons making up your spinal cord. The meninges are there as a protective coating, all three of the layers. So, Meningitis does not mean that you have an active infection within your brain. It means you have an active infection, inflammation of the, meningi, the meningeal coverings. So nothing is in the brain yet. That's in a few slides from now when we talk encephalitis. So meningi, meningitis is the meninges only. Okay, Remember, this is the protective barrier. Chapter 16, I told you, and I harped on, and I pointed out every chance I could that the appearance of the rash, what does it look like, pustules, vesicles, whatnot, and where it's located, where does it start, where does it spread to, is clinically indicative of what disease you're talking about. With meningitis, Presentation is going to look the same no matter what, but what we see here is it's an age difference. Infants, adolescents, young and adults, three groups. Three groups that are going to have different microbes, bacteria, viruses, that are the chief or the top of the list of possible infectious agents. Remember, I told you in a previous lecture, when it comes to medicine, medicine is not cut and dry. Does this see this caused by this? A caused by B? No, a lot of the times it's going to be C, A. Here's your list of top five bacteria that can cause this. CB, here's the list of the top three viruses. And then you go from there. Well, as a clinician, this is what you're going to see. An infant with meningitis, its list is going to be different than the adolescent. The adolescence is going to be different than the adult. Not saying there's not some overlap, that there's a a bacteria that could be on all three or a virus that could be on all three. It's just saying that they're reordered 
and they may or may not have some differences. When we're talking meningitis, basically spinal tap. Gonna have to get in there and make sure that the cerebral spinal fluid is still nice and clear, low, pro, uh, low protein, high glucose levels. Low protein, high glucose level is what the body wants to maintain, keeps those neurons happy, happy. If those switch, high protein, which means that the bacteria that could be there are shedding proteins, surface proteins, LPS, or the glucose is low, means those bacteria are eating up all the free sugar. Gram stain of the lumbar puncture fluid going to inoculate some of the different broths and, cult and plates that we've talked about in lecture and you've seen in lab, see if anything grows. And what you're also going to do is you're going to start treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics immediately. Okay, you don't know if it's bacterial or viral, but you can't wait. Once a patient presents in the ER or the clinic, you immediately start with the big, heavy sledgehammer. Here's every antibiotic we've got, and then some, and we're going to start. And as we start getting the results back from the ID lab, we will start to wean it down to specific antibiotics to specific antivirals but you can't wait that 12 to 24 hours could be the difference between a patient you know surviving and being okay and well forgetting what their last birthday was because they've lost a couple of neural pathways okay for all meningitis you know here's a quick list of the common symptoms you're going to see. Severe headache, um, borderline, um, what's, they're going to complain it's one of the worst headaches they have ever had. Okay. Um, they're not going to have um, the uh, reaction to light sound like you would get with a migraine, but they're going to sit there and they're going to be discussing it in migraine levels of pain. Uh, painful or stiff neck. If you're listening to this lecture, I want you to stop right now and I want you to tilt your head forward. Under normal conditions, you should be able to touch your chin to your chest. Somebody has meningitis, the meninges have swollen up and have stiffened up and that increased fluid pressure in their spinal cord and their spinal column makes it so they can only move their chin up and down maybe a few inches at best and that's going to be painful to do there's no touching their chin to their chest fever is going to be present because they have an all over body inflammatory response nausea vomiting photophobia may or may not be there the light sensitivity um as i stated the first symptom um the presence absence of this helps some clinicians i've been told um, be able to discern men possible meningitis from um, having a, patients having a bad migraine skin rashes may or may not be present depending upon what's causing the meningitis is it a bacterial infection or a viral infection if it's a bacterial infection that's causing it could have started off as a skin infection and went back to remic and it settled out in the meninges and you're going to see when you do the spinal pump the lumbar puncture increased white blood cells in the fluid 